So you aren't professional liars then? I do not agree with that statement. I actually, um, I've heard a number of novelists use it and I know what they mean. What they're saying is that there are no limits um, in fiction. You can invent or make up whatever you want. But for me, a good work of fiction, a good novel, always has some deep emotional truth to it. In fact, I often think that fiction uh, can be better at telling those emotional truths than nonfiction. When you're writing a book, when or how are you able to understand when you've reached that truth? Since it's a long process. It's a feeling. It's absolutely a gut feeling, and that's very strange. I've thought about this too. What are we measuring ourselves against? I mean, when you write a sentence and say, ah, I did it, that's how it's supposed to be. You're actually not measuring it against any external reality, but only against some inner uh, pre-conscious sense of rightness, of some uh, truth-telling, but it's not... Uh, literal truth-telling. Uh. Hmm. Is it mystical? No, I don't think it's mystical. I actually think there may be um, ways to talk about this. Um, William James, whom I love, uh, talks about something very similar. That, you know, what, what exactly is the source of thoughts? Um, it's some pre-conscious and unconscious unco reality that is present in all human beings and um, writing a work of fiction or indeed making any work of art is dredging um, up that pre-conscious unconscious uh, world that we all have and that unconscious world is of course also shaped by the outside world you know it's a loop uh, James uses that word I like it it's a loop of the outside to the inside and we also have a great many unconscious memories or implicit memories as well. So I think sometimes, uh, perhaps often, uh, the act of writing fiction is taking from those implicit or unconscious memories. Hmm. It's not mystical, but it's not easy to understand. And I can say that, you know, in science too, no one fully understands this. And um, scientists have a tendency to, or they need to be reductive. And, uh, but the, that connection between the imagination and memory seems to be um, finding, they, they're finding more and more evidence for it. Who is the shaking woman? The shaking woman um, is... Uh, the, the Shaking Woman is both a stranger and someone that I've embraced, I think, finally. But, um, you know, all neurological events, I mean, I think for, for example, a person who's suffering from epilepsy, the seizures um, are, you know, surprising. It is the body out of control. Uh, early seizures, anyway, the seizures that um, people haven't become used to. Um, then I think, as with every illness, people begin to feel that this is part of one's reality. And uh, you have to integrate it into that reality. But who she is exactly? I don't know. I think she's, she's I. <laughs> Why did you choose to write about her? I think that... Um, I think it was a real uh, intellectual exercise in some way. It was an exercise um, from two points of view, from the first person and from the third person. And the third person is uh, that um, other self that can look on and evaluate the personal story through all kinds of other material, through uh, various disciplines. Uh, neurology, psychiatry, philosophy, literature, uh, and see what comes out of it. What seems to come out of it is uh, increasing 
ambiguity. <laughs> so the more you know and the more uh, categories you adopt to examine the same phenomenon, the more uh, the phenomenon seems to escape those categories. Why is that? Because every discipline has its own frames for looking at, um, at something. So neuroscience, for example, is um, very connected to ideas of uh, localization, areas in the brain that are activated when something is happening. This is extremely different from what a psychoanalyst does when he or she looks at um, a symptom. And uh, psychiatry, too, is uh, often far less interested in uh, brain processes, even though it's more interested now than it used to be. And, um, and, they, and what they want to do is categorize illness through symptoms, often symptoms that uh, don't take into account a story or a narrative. So my little book is partly a plea to restore um, the idea of narrative to medicine. Mm. What, 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 what do you mean by that? I mean that um, people who are ill, say they have a psychiatric illness, say they're depressed, and they end up in the hospital and a psychiatrist looks at them and he uses the criteria that are given in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And he ticks off his list and he says, oh, this person has one symptom after another of depression. So now I'm going to give a diagnosis, depression. Major depression, say. Uh, and my argument is that, yes, the person is depressed. Probably the psychiatrist has made an accurate diagnosis. But there's also a story, a human story, behind the depression. Or the depression is a story. And it's very hard to separate symptoms from the story. And um, more and more, uh, that isn't done. You know, doctors, I mean, you read case studies from the 19th century, and doctors were intent on following the narrative of a patient and her illness. Now it's less true. Of course, in psychoanalysis, narrative is very important, but uh, it's not uh, the construction of a story. Uh, I think I said this before, is not um, necessarily the true story. Hmm. So disease is storytelling, or should be? Well, way. there should be more storytelling in it. It's not wholly that. I mean, if you have cancer, I mean, and people find the tumor and they can get it out, that's, that's a good thing. Um, so it's not only story, even though there would be certainly a story of a developing cancer as well. Um, but I just mean that it's very hard to separate a human being from his or her illness as it develops over time. Mm. But when disease is told as a story, as you have done in the, the history of your nurse, what happens then? What is revealed in a way? Um, well, it's not exactly a story. I mean, there are narratives in it. Uh, but the book is also, you know, I keep um, ranging around from one position to another. The idea of the book is to examine this particular story, this little story of seizures, from multiple perspectives. And it seems to me that the course, over the course of the book, my fantasy, at least, is that the reader becomes aware of how enormously complicated even this fairly short story is. Mm. Yeah. The psychoanalysis and um, the work of a psychiatrist is so interesting because, and as you show in uh, The Sorrows of an American, where people come in and start telling their story. Um, and you're able then to shape your own story in a way by what, what you're telling. 
Isn't that so? Yes. And as I said, I mean, no story, I think, that we tell ourselves about our own lives. I've just been writing an essay about this, about m memoir autobiography in the novel. Um, you know, what is the difference? And uh, since I truly believe that we often invent our own pasts and the imagination plays a powerful role in memoir and autobiography as, as well as in the novel. Um, this too is um, not simple to untangle. So uh, I guess my ultimate intellectual position about things is um, is how difficult it is to arrive at a single point of clarity, whether it's remembering your own life or uh, or studying um, a certain phenomenon. Do you miss a point of clarity? Um, you know, in my working life, I don't. I actually enjoy uh, ambiguity, not just a big messy fog, but ambiguities that are art are articulated in, in one way or another and sharpened so that it's possible to see how uh, things don't fit together so easily. I think in my life as a human being, I'm much more dedicated to order. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty orderly here, actually. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I, you know, I, I, I like order. I, it, it helps me uh, think. I'm not someone who enjoys chaotic environments or um, chaotic relationships. Why is the shaking woman shaking? Well, there is no answer to that question. I mean, that's the whole point of the book. There is no simple, reductive, easy answer to that question. And, um, and I think that it applies to any number of illnesses. It is not only this particular case, my particular case. Uh, you know, scientists often say something that I find um, important to recognize, and many times uh, it's not fully recognized, at least not by a lay public which is that correlation is not cause. Which means? Which means that you may be able to correlate eating broccoli to not getting cancer, but it doesn't mean that eating broccoli is going to prevent cancer. You can make a correlation. All these people out there in our study ate broccoli every single day, and, you know, they got fewer cancers than people who did not eat broccoli. You see this all the time. This is a constant in the press. Mm. But the correlation between those two things is not a cause. And so my um, disorder, or whatever you want to call it, is not very different from many other people's disorders because you've, the cause is just not identified. 